So, um, the last time that I saw your lovely selves, <laughs> which feels like a really long time ago because of all these funny public holidays, um, we had been looking at the um, idea of composition for the paper three exams. And I wanted to continue on from where we had stopped. So I'm going to share my screen with you. And we're going to look at, <clears throat> here we go, the document that we have been using to examine the kinds of responses students have been writing to these sorts of questions, the paper three questions. So this is something you can find online. Um, if you want a copy of it, you can always ask me as well. Um, on the web chat system, not here in Zoom, okay? Um, and what's nice is that it just gives you an example of the kinds of responses students write to questions. And it's a good indication of the kind of thing you could achieve because the student has been placed under exam conditions and, ha and, and has written under a certain time limit. So it just opens your eyes to the kinds of things you could, um, you could write about in that time frame if you are super prepared and super, super practiced, okay? So paper 31, it's all about directed writing and composition. And yes, we've already looked at some of these. We looked at descriptive writing last time. Today, we're gonna to focus on narrative writing. And narrative refers to the idea of story. Here is a story. So um, this paper is chiefly an assessment of candidates' writing skills. Right? The two questions that are in the paper are each marked out of 25. So in section one for directed writing, there are 15 marks for writing and 10 for reading. And in section two, composition, what we're focusing on today, the marks are divided between A, content and structure, so what you write and how you structure it, and then style and accuracy. Style, did you give them what they wanted in the question? Did you give a mystery story? Um, accuracy, uh, were your sentences written correctly? Was your spelling correct? All that kind of thing. You can read this for yourselves. Um, I just want to get into the actual response because we always run out of time. So <laughs> section two composition, this is what it would look like. And we've seen this before. Um, you know, we've, we've gone over argumentative discursive writing. We've gone over descriptive writing. And don't worry if you've missed those lessons. Um, this is everything, every time you come to a live lesson, you learn new concepts anyway. It's not like you have to have um, watched last week's live lesson in order to do this week's live lesson. You will always learn something new. And then narrative writing, which is what I want to look at today, this idea of story. So if you were sitting in an exam and you got this paper and you were going to do the narrative writing, if you are good at story writing, um, then you would have to choose between these two, 4A or B. Now A says, and it starts with a quote, so that means you're going to have to um, use that quote. Okay, If you're given a quote, you generally have to use it. As they looked in the mirror, they were amazed to find two completely different people smiling back at them. Use this sentence as the beginning of a story. Note that it's a beginning of a story, okay? Or write a story in which the central theme is flying. Okay, so um, there's quite a bit of scope here. You're given some interesting thoughts and you could choose whichever one you want to do. So, Let's have a look at one of the sample responses. And before we do that, just very quickly, the two marks that you're given out of 25, um, that content and structure, that, that counts for 13 marks, and your style and accuracy counts for 12 marks. So um, bear that in mind. Your content is ever so slightly more important than your style and accuracy, okay? I've also included how they mark things here, the mark scheme. You can have a look at that yourselves. We don't really have time to go into it in too much detail. But here is a sample response for question B, writing about a story about flight, flying. Okay, so this student has been quite clever. I think I'm just going to try and make this ever so slightly bigger. Okay. This student has been quite clever in that they're given a title straight away, The Flight for Life or Death. Okay, so um, we already know that there's going to be some idea of choosing between life or death, perhaps. Okay, so that's a good title. And it starts out with some dialogue. And we know this because there are quote marks, speech marks. 1400 hours uh, lime juice go. Okay, so somebody has spoken. And what was it? My radio crackled. I checked my watch as the number seemed familiar. Lime juice, the code word for takeoff. It was time. Okay, so somebody has to take off the speaker. 
I looked to the left of me and saw Spitfire 1896 draw alongside me. I looked to the right and saw Spitfire 1898 draw up as well. Lime juice now. I revved my engine and took off down the runway. The engine was screaming. The noise was unbearable. My stomach lurched at the possibility that maybe I would run out of runway and fall off into the perilous sea. Adrenaline was surging through my body. I held my breath tight. Any minute now, any minute, I was up. My muscles relaxed. My heart stopped racing. I let out my anguished breath. Okay, so just having looked at this first section, what strikes you as good? What strikes you as not so good? Let me bring down the chat here. What, what, what strikes you straight away when you read this, this, uh, this opening to this um, essay, if you want to call it that? What strikes you about it? Give me some good things, give me some bad things. Okay, so perhaps the writer could have used different paragraphs. Okay, so yeah, there's um, um, yeah, perhaps that uh, title is a bit too close. Maybe some ideas could have been spread out a bit. Uh, okay, possibly, yeah. Bad spelling, okay, definitely. <laughs> there's definitely some bad spelling. Did anybody spot words that were spelt wrong? And if so, which ones? <laughs> and good morning to those of you joining now. Nice to see you. <laughs> okay, so. Give me some, okay, good. Precarious, yes. Although, I actually think they meant perilous. I think they meant perilous because perilous means dangerous, whereas precarious also means dangerous, but it means something is tottering on the edge of danger. And can the sea really totter on the edge of danger or is the sea perilous? So I, I think it might be per, perilous. Oh, difficult to tell. Okay, good. So there's one. What else, anything else? I'm just testing your vocab skills here. Spelling and vocab. <laughs> it, let's say we didn't look at um, spelling errors, but we looked at sentence structure errors. Do you notice any? And these are ones that are tough to spot because students struggle with sentence structures. Okay, so since nothing is coming through right now, because obviously you have to read through it, I'm sorry, I always rush you. I'm going to show you one here. I held my breath tight. I held my breath tight any minute now. How can you hold your breath tight any minute now? Okay. I held my breath tight. Tightly, maybe, would be better. And then semicolon to create a pause. Some linked idea coming in. Any minute now. Any minute. Okay, good. And Somebody's pointed out that there's this repetition of any minute now, any minute. But it actually is okay in this instance, this repetition, simply because it adds to the tension. So sometimes we have what's called poetic license, where you can manipulate um, texts to add more emotion. So it's not necessarily an error, it's intentional. And I think it was intentional here, this idea of I've got to take off, I've got to take off any minute now, any minute, and then they feel the aircraft lift up. So that was for the sake of effect, but nice that you spotted that. Um, okay, so <laughs> thank you for trying to spot some errors. Good, there's definitely some spelling errors. Rev should have had a double V here. Lurched should have been L-U-R-C-H-E-D. Um, various things like that. Spitfire is one word, one minute, and then it's two words the next minute. So um, watch out for that kind of thing in your own writing. All right, let's continue. So we have this pilot who's been told to take off and go, and they're taking off um, and um, flying up just above the sea. I was rising fast now. My protis, protisional, I'm not sure what, that, what they mean by that. If it was provisional, it still wouldn't make sense if you look up the meaning of provisional. Um, oh, and just before I move on, one more thing. There should be a few commas added in this, in this section here. Yes. Commas to break up ideas. That would have worked as well. Good. So always be aware of sentence structures. So let's continue. I was rising fast now. My protisional, provisional vision let me realize that 1896 and 1898 had risen and were now rising alongside me too. I wasn't alone. 
And there's a good use of an ellipsis there to create the tension. I wasn't alone yet, okay? But I had my, my comrades with me um, and I wasn't alone yet. So we know that the speaker is in fear of this idea of being alone. So that ellipsis works well there, the three dots, dot, dot, dot. Worry, however, crept back into my mind of the daunted task ahead of me. The daunted task. Can a task be daunted? No, a task cannot be daunted, right? It should be daunting. Okay, you need the adjective daunting. Uh, yeah, daunted um, is kind of a verb. Okay, something is daunted, right? So daunting would have worked better here or would have been correct. I tried to calm myself down with supposed confidence boosting thoughts. I know what to do. The plan is simple. I have been flying for years. I can dodge, dip, roll, and move well. I can dodge what is thrown at me. However, these thoughts meant nothing now. It was just me and my Spitfire, which could now keep me alive. So building up more tension. Interesting that there's an indication of thoughts through the use of a speech, a single quote mark, a speech mark. Okay. So let's continue on to the next paragraph. The crossing from Germany to London. So now we know that the pilot is flying from Germany to London, the capital of Britain, was to take six hours, meaning I was to drop my first shell at 1802. So all of this language indicates that we are in a wartime situation. This is the setting of the story. The challenge faced seems so easy. However, the British artillery and the gunfire um, tanks and guns would not hold back. So uh, the speaker must be a German soldier who is going to bomb London. And if you know about the war, this did happen. So obviously the speaker is aware of these facts. The challenge face seems so easy. However, the British artillery, artillery would not hold back. Corporal Johnny Jagger died last week on the last air raid plan. His plane was shot down by their artillery. I knew him. I grew up with him. Was I now, uh, was I now to follow in his footsteps? Okay, so very nice use of a rhetorical question, um, emphasizing the speaker's doubt. Am I, also, is, am I also going to be killed on this raid, just like my friend? I, it could easily just have been me as it was him. Right. I checked my watch. It was 1600 hours. The radio crackled in. You should be leaving Blue Zone and entering Pine Region soon. One thing I notice here is inconsistency. They start out using double speech marks, but then revert to single quote marks. Um, I think that would be okay for a thought to distinguish the speech from the thought if you wanted to argue that. But if you've started out using double speech marks, continue using double speech marks, then we know it's the radio that is chatting to the, right, the speaker. You should be leaving Blue Zone and entering Pine Region soon. I checked my map. Blue zone being Germany and Pine region being Belgium. Okay, so there's a bit of um, sentence structure area there. If you, if you were just to read the sentence on its own, blue zone being Germany and Pine region being Belgium, yes, what about these regions? Okay, so we need more clarification. That would be an incomplete or fragment sentence. It's a fragment of a sentence. Calculated correctly in approximately 12 minutes, I was leaving the safety of the Blue Zone territory and safety net in which I wanted to stay. So the writer has done quite well here in giving us a bit more context in um, revealing exactly what's happening and sort of mapping this journey that they are currently undergoing in the airplane. Sweat accumulated on my forehead. I was just over an hour away. So this is good imagery, shows you that they're anxious. Adrenaline surged around my body. What if I was blown out of the sky? What if my flight skills fail me? What if 1896 and 1898 go down? Do I stay? Do I go? What do I do? <laughs> so a nice listing of rhetorical questions, emphasizing anxiety. These questions were bouncing around my head. I told myself to breathe. My hand was sweaty on the joystick and my face began to feel clammy and cold. I felt sick. My head was light. I was now 13 minutes away. Hmm. Okay. I said my prayers. My thoughts began to drift when the radio crackled in. The clouds are high, meaning you will have to drop below them. Do this only at 1802 hours. 
It's 20 hundred hours local time, meaning it is dark and harder for them. Good luck. Okay, that should be two words there. Good luck. Okay. Was that the last few words I will ever hear? I thought frantically. And that's a nice use of an adverb. Okay, this is an adverb. They are thinking frantically, it shows their panic. I checked my watch, I checked my map, four minutes. Now, here, <laughs> you could argue that this is an incomplete sentence. However, in context of the creative aspect of the section, trying to build up tension, that poetic license comes in again, where you can say, I check my watch, I check my map, four minutes. It makes sense in, in that kind of a context, all right? So you can use what we call fragment sentences if they are used intentionally for the sake of effect. But just be careful the way that you do it. 1801, the sky was lit up next to me. I dodged hurriedly to the left. They knew we were here. Another blasted ray of light. I ducked, dipped, and dodged. Do you see this nice use of alliteration emphasizing his, his fast movements? Duck, dip, dodged. My hand was sweating frantically whilst I frantically, okay, there is an overuse of the word frantically. Uh, I frantically tried to keep control of the joist and guide myself to someone. 1802, so keep an eye on the time. I dive. I saw 1896 blown out of sight. Standing there. His plane had been lighted up like a bonfire. Do we talk about something being lighted up or lit up like a bonfire? Okay, and here's a nice use of the word, of a, sorry, of the device of a simile, okay? Comparing this um, flame that has um, gone on fire to a bonfire. And it had been hurried to the floor. I looked to the right of me, there was no sign of 1898. My worst nightmare, so using the idea of a metaphor here to compare the situation that he finds himself in, my worst nightmare had revealed itself. I was alone. Me. My radio and flying skills was all I had now, which could keep me away from the British artillery and death. Okay, so, interesting. Do you think this person has, or would you say this person has um, drawn you into the story? Is it a story or is it pure description? Think about when we looked at that descriptive essay, or the descriptive um, piece, and think about this piece. Is this descriptive or is it narrative? What's your opinion? Is it descriptive or narrative? Okay, so we're having some um, things come through. Okay, let me see how many of you are saying which one it is. Is this descriptive or is it narrative? Okay, all right, good. I shall reveal the answer. Okay, good. So what's interesting is, for the first four uh, suggestions coming through with your comments, um, two people have said it's descriptive, and two people have said it's narrative. And the answer is, it's narrative, but I know why you said descriptive, because guess what? It contains descriptions. Absolutely, it does. It is descriptive. So that's the difference between a descriptive piece and a narrative piece. In description, um, you really are focusing on setting, uh, you know, the beautiful meadows, the warm sunshine, um, the, the flittering butterflies. That is description. But narrative, there's a story. Something happens. Something happens here, there, and there. There are events. Things take place. Um, and so that's why this is a narrative. There is a story even though in story writing we describe things because we have to make the story interesting. Yes, the bombed plane lit up like a bonfire, that's a description, but it's part of um, the events that are described and that's the difference, okay? So good, I'm glad you tried. It's definitely narrative, okay? So here's a beautiful suggestion. Description is a moment, whereas narrative is a story. Very nice, yes, absolutely. Description is a moment, almost like a moment in time, describing everything that is around you. Whereas narrative, things happen over time. Good, very, very nice, well done. Okay, 
So let's see what the examiner said about this. This is a relevant and interesting response to the question. There is a sense of immediacy from the outset and the scene is nicely set, so we know where we are. For the most part, there is a strong focus on inner thoughts as the candidate deals with emotions of the pilot. The use of rhetorical questions adds to the tension of the piece, although details tend to be repeated, sweat, adrenaline, sickness. Other details about place and feelings would certainly have added to the atmosphere in this story. So more details needed. The climax, however, is fairly well handled and there is a sense of poignancy, of sorrow, about losing others and the difference between actually being completely alone compared to feeling alone. So they're two different things. You're actually alone, not just feeling lonely. There is some effective vocabulary throughout the essay, but sentence separation errors, commas instead of full stops, and spelling errors seriously detract. So this focused on content and structure, and this focused on style and accuracy. And so this person got eight out of 13 for content and structure, and six out of uh, 12 for style and accuracy. So perhaps just that bit more attention to detail here, even if you can't be creative under pressure, knowing how to spell words properly and to write sentences properly could have added more marks. You know, if being creative under pressure is very hard, but knowing your, your um, grammar is important. There's no excuse for that. Okay. Right, so we have six minutes left. <laughs> and um, there is a brilliant, brilliant answer here that, believe it or not, got full marks. 13 out of 13, 12 out of 12. I couldn't believe it when I saw that. So yes, it's possible to get full marks with Cambridge. How amazing. I'm just going to read a little bit of it um, because it is just so well written. And you'll get a sense of that when we, when we look at it. So 4A. Now, Remember, you were given an opening sentence and you had to continue the idea, right? Um, and I think it had to be, let's just look very quickly at that, sen at that question again. Use the sentence as the beginning of a story, all right? So there's an opening to a story that is going to be continued beyond whatever happens here. So let's have a look. Uh, as they look in the mirror, they were amazed to find two completely different people smiling back at them. The genetic alteration had worked perfectly on the two fresh-faced recruits, changing their DNA to that which was deemed suitable by the human army. Their smiles wore off as quickly as the anesthetic did. So that's why they're smiling, because they're under anesthetic. And both men now realized what they had become. No longer individuals, but templates only recognizable as different by the differing numbers branded upon their shoulders so this person has decided to write about uh, write a, a sci-fi story um, something that could possibly happen in theory private b617 so they name uh, the the protagonist the main character here was still feeling the after effects of the treatment as he was carted into the adjacent, adjacent room and his service uniform was being fitted roughly onto him. No care there then. His mind wandered to the past, to a time before his name was a letter, followed by three numbers, to a time when he was Harry Elson, a farmer back on his home world. So that's reinforcing the sense of a sci-fi setting. The human army, so we know it's the humans versus somebody else. The day was hot and lazy. How interesting is that? Um, as a description, the day was hot and lazy. And his beautiful fair-haired wife was beckoning him inside from the bright yellow cornfield as the golden orange sun faded in the sky. So some description here, giving the piece, um, enriching the piece. He remembered a helicopter and a military-looking man greeting him. Something about a war against a race from far away. Something about intervening after a neutral planet had been invaded. Something about doing his duty. This person is well exposed to the sci-fi genre or to, to computer games. <laughs> okay, So um, they write writing well and they are in control of the subject by using these ideas and concepts that um, they use with confidence. 
everything after that blurred and mixed together in a swirl of color. Let's try and do one more paragraph. Private B617 woke up from his daydream to find himself gripping a combat rifle in a helicopter amongst a group of identical faces. Outside, the lashing rain bounced off the flying helicopter, and in the distance, there was the muffled crackling of gunfire. B617 noticed that he was being addressed. A figure with a white stripe down his shoulder pad was bellowing orders against the cacophony, or the cacophony sorry, of noise outside. He was saying they had 30 seconds until they dropped, and their objective was to assist in resisting an enemy counterattack in this area. After a brief pause, the order came. Drop. Okay, look, the good use of exclamation marks, the good use of double speech marks, that one single um, statement standing on its own, drop. The helicopter side door was flung open and one by one, each soldier hurled themselves out into the darkness. The noise hit B-617 like a wave. All around him was gunfire, screams, groans, death. Using the senses here to evoke um, the this, this setting as one. The soldiers opened up their parachutes and glided down to the scarred battlescape below them. Not a landscape, a battlescape. How interesting. And it carries on like this. Um, brilliant vocabulary, lovely descriptions. And at the end, um, he goes back to that vision he had seen of his sweetheart because, sorry, and here's a spoiler alert, he dies, okay? Um, so Harry slowly lost consciousness and another number quietly faded away. He fades away into death, in other words. And what the marker says, and we're on the last minute here, so I'm going to rush, this is an excellent piece of writing and an example of a first-class narrative completed under exam conditions. The initial quotation blends in beautifully to a futuristic setting in which men have become templates only recognizable as different by the differing numbers branded upon their shoulders. Referring to a stream of red on his arm and firing blindly at dim specks, which we didn't have a chance to look at, but which are in the piece, effortlessly underlines the fact that the soldier and the others do not recognize what they are doing as they are now non-human. So he doesn't call it blood, he calls it stream of red on his arm, dim specks, the enemy is just dim specks. So um, emphasizing this fact they are non-human. Flashback is beautifully handled to his past when he was human and is used again at the end as a structural device to bring the dying robot cyborg soldier back to a happier human time and provide an excellent, well thought out ending. The writing is sophisticated, clever and virtually error free. So very, very well done to this person. It is possible guys, full marks, yay. Okay.